in the age of pilgrimages, the age of Romanesque art, we saw Europe emerge from the turn of the millennium, frankly overjoyed that the world had not ended. They were relieved that the Viking and Magyar raids, as well as the plague, seemed to be subsiding. They were further affirmed in their faith and their confidence as Christian Spaniards slowly won the Iberian Peninsula back from its Muslim rulers. Towns were recovering, and energized by a papal plea, Western Europeans set out on a series of crusades. The crusades did not recapture the Holy Land for very long, but they did bring back new goods and fresh ideas with the crusaders. In our next era, the Gothic art of the High Middle Ages, Western European Christendom became even more prosperous and self-confident, I would even say exuberant. A major church reform movement restored monastic discipline and strengthened the papacy. Towns multiplied, and some towns, such as Paris, became major cities. Learning moved beyond monasteries. New urban universities were founded, and they sought to reconcile Christian revelation, scriptural teaching, with Greek philosophy, logic, and mathematics. A gentle, loving Virgin Mary reigned as the Queen of Heaven and offered believers ready access to her son. The final judgment was still waiting, of course, but Christianity in this new era seemed kinder, gentler, and more confident of happy endings. Before we get into the complex technology of Gothic architecture, let's return to the White Garment of Church's video and look at the role the new cathedrals played in a revitalized European urban landscape. Again, we're looking at cities. This late Gothic illuminated manuscript, by the way, shows some of the skilled crafts involved in cathedral construction. Your textbook and the next portion of the video are both going to emphasize the sudden birth of the Gothic in Abbot Suget's great Cathedral of Saint-Denis. Well, yes and no. Saint-Denis does represent a major stylistic breakthrough, but the architectural technological groundwork had really already been laid in late Romanesque churches. As you may or may not remember from my Romanesque lectures, Roman groin vaults were first re-employed in Spire Cathedral in Germany, which reaches almost as high as the highest Gothic cathedrals. Ribbed vaults, likewise, enabled builders to reach new heights in the northern cathedrals of St. Etienne at Cannes and Durham Cathedral, which are shown here uh, in constructing rib vaults, by the way, the ribs themselves were built first and the surrounding area or web was filled in with lighter material. Durham Cathedral combined the rib vaults with pointed arches, which was another innovation that permitted the greater use of clerestory windows to admit more light. Still, these churches relied on thick pillars and on broad transverse or diaphragm arches, that is, arches that span and therefore break up the nave to support their heavy ceilings. And they still conveyed that impression of great mass, of heavy, maybe a little oppressive religious might. And this was the characteristic of Romanesque architecture. So, Abbot Suget did transform church architecture with the Cathedral of Saint-Denis, and he did it as much with an idea as he did with a technological breakthrough. Like his Romanesque predecessors, he wanted to show God's and his patron king's majesty, but he chose to do it with color, and even more, he chose to do it with light. So let's switch videos now and look at the first excerpt from a PBS special entitled Building the Great Cathedrals. The link to the entire video is posted on Moodle, and I really recommend it, especially for any of you who find engineering as intriguing as art. You'll also see some rather cool computer-generated images. So yes, Santini built on architectural innovations that Romanesque architects had already begun to employ. And yes, its look really was entirely new. What changed the appearance of cathedrals so dramatically in the Gothic age were the acres of stained glass and much more open appearance of the nave, the choir, the aisles, and apse chapels. This ambulatory at Saint-Denis is one of the most famous works in art history for just this reason. 
To quote Abbe Suje, Abbot Suje himself, the whole church shone with the wonderful and uninterrupted light of most luminous windows pervading the interior beauty. He gave the credit not to himself, by the way, or even to the architect whose name we do not know to this day, but to God. To quote Suje again, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. Thou uniformly conjoinest, that means joins the material with the immaterial, the corporeal, that means the bodily, with the spiritual, the human with the divine. I should note that Suger was a student of Plato, and the still new University of Paris was the center of scholasticism, where scholars such as St. Thomas Aquinas conjoined or reconciled what they saw as the light of reason with the light of the gospel. While later Renaissance historians would scorn this period, it was actually one of their number, not a, not a contemporary of the Middle Ages, who dubbed this the Gothic or Barbarian Age. In fact, the Gothic High Middle Ages saw the birth of a religious humanism that still lies at the heart of Catholic theology. Yes, God is greater than man, but man is still God's creation. And the ability, and by the way, man, I of course mean men and women, our ability to reason to uncover truth is a gift of God because we're made in his image. Also, I should note that Suger had a political as well as a theological motive. Saint-Denis was a royal abbey which enshrined the relics of the patron saint of France and was the burial place for the Capetian line of kings. This is the line of kings, the dynasty ruling at the time. Refurbishing the abbey church was part of the abbot's agenda for strengthening the power and reach of these kings who were still fairly weak. France was still really divided among warring nobles. Let me make one last point before we start getting technical. Abbot Suger and his many imitators saw the church as a new Jerusalem, or as St. Augustine had put it many centuries earlier, a city of God. Let me quote Abbot Suger one more time, and you do have this in your notes template. I see myself dwelling, as it were, in some strange region of the universe which exists neither entirely in the slime of the earth nor entirely in the purity of heaven, and that by the grace of God I can be transported from this inferior to that higher world. He was transported, of course, by entering his church. So the Gothic cathedral reaches for the heavens. It can't quite get there. Like God's creation, it's filled with light, but it's an otherworldly, a colored, a filtered light. If you get a Sacred Spaces essay, stained glass windows are a gold mine, and we'll learn more about them in the next lecture. But I am going to stop waxing poetical now and move back to the technical analysis of Gothic art. How does this plan look different from the apse you saw in Romanesque cathedrals, even when you're not viewing all that extraordinary glass? The floor plan on the right, by the way, is from St. Sernan. And you've seen, you have this on a separate handout without the similarities, differences, labels. I didn't want to make the pictures any smaller. So take a moment to write down notes on the floor plan. What do you see? What are the similarities and differences? Well, both churches have radiating chapels, but at St. Denis, the walls between the apse chapels, or the apsidal chapels, as they're sometimes called, uh, have been removed, opening up the cathedral dramatically. And here's an interior view of the two churches. Let there be light, huh? The picture on the upper right uh, gives a hint of one of the ways that this is done, which is, by the way, just the picture here, I eliminated another one. What you see are flying buttresses, but we're not actually quite there yet. Let's return to the PBS video and put on our inner geek as we look at how the pointed arch, the rib vault, and the flying buttresses made soaring light-filled Gothic cathedrals possible. Since I'm skipping a chunk of this very interesting video, let me briefly explain what's going on here. The stonemasons you're about to see were rebuilding a transitional Romanesque Gothic chapel. And in the process, they were testing theories about Gothic architecture. And here's the story behind the chapel itself. Uh, an American newspaper millionaire, William Randolph Hearst, uh, bought himself a crumbling Spanish monastery chapel in the 1920s. He had the whole thing dismantled and shipped stone by stone to California, where he ran out of money. 
Eventually, an order of American Cistercian monks raised the money to have the chapel reconstructed at their monastery in the Sacramento Valley. And PBS filmed part of the process in 2010. It's a great story. Uh, which is why I'm including a link to a newspaper story about the project on this PowerPoint and on Moodle. By the way, the video will give you insight into how these buildings were originally constructed using wooden scaffolding. The video will also allow you a closer look at one of the greatest French Gothic cathedrals, the Cathedral of Amiens. One reason I'm inflicting such long video clips on you is that they really offer a much better view of cathedrals than still photography can capture. So here's a very clear example of a pointed arch from the High Gothic Ram Cathedral. And here are some more images of the cathedral at Amiens, the tallest completed cathedral in France, and the French cathedral with the greatest interior volume. Note that like Chartres, it has two rather different towers built 50 years apart. Unlike Chartres, it has lost most of its original stained glass. You won't see this part of the video unless you watch it online, but the cathedral actually includes a huge metal chain that was strung red hot around the inside of the nave to hold up those tall, narrow pillars, which were cracking. If you're interested, check out the entire video on YouTube. It's really kind of a fun one. And let's move on now to the second major architectural element that made Gothic cathedrals possible. Now, Romanesque churches did sometimes have buttresses. Usually they were built up against the side of the outer walls or, as this diagram of Durham Cathedral's buttresses show, disguised within the interior. Gothic architects did away with the tribune galleries that would, would be under that lower arch. They exposed the buttresses and they pared them down to slender skeletal supports. They also carved them and topped them with little spires and made them essentially part of the decorative element of the facade. So here's another clip from the video. This slide helpfully relates the flying buttresses of Chartres Cathedral to its floor plan. Remember, I've meant, emphasized you need to understand floor plans. And this elevation illustrates the impact this innovation had on the internal plan. Note that the triforium level is relatively smaller and the clerestory of stained glass is much, much larger. And here's still another elevation of Chartres Cathedral showing the smaller triforium and the much larger windows. Ah! And now we see it in a photograph. So here you see how carving on the flying buttresses echoed the carving in the tower and the design of the towers and windows, which helped unite the interior and exterior. And now finally we come to the third technical feature that permitted Gothic cathedrals to include huge walls of glass. What's especially interesting about this diagram, uh, which you may recognize from your book, is that the Romanesque and Gothic vaults are actually the same size, but the pointed arch and the ribbing make the Gothic arch appear higher. Um, the rib vaults also create a rhythmic pattern that helps tie the ceiling together and create a greater impression of unity uh, than Romanesque ceilings had, even though there are usually many more vaults in a Gothic ceiling. So we're going to build some of these. Sorry, I don't always remember exactly how these slides built. They were, I'm using somebody else's slides. Oh, wow, this is really flying around, isn't it? I think on your notes page, you have the final version copied because I thought that got confusing. Okay, here's another diagram. You're going to see some of the complex rib vaults when we get to the British Gothic cathedrals. Ah, another diagram that's going to build, and another complicated diagram that I've reproduced for you on your slide. Uh, this shows how a, shows a series of nave elevations as Gothic cathedrals grew higher, bolder, and more dominated by stained glass. Note that the narrow pointed windows are called lancets. Oops, sorry about that. We'll go back. Uh, and what about that smaller circular window? That's an oculus. The plural, by the way, is oculi. So which Roman building had a famous oculus? The Pantheon. It's the uncovered hole at the top of the dome and the building's only source of light. I hope that's the last of the screwy slides. Uh, here's a photo of this elevation in Chartres Cathedral. And in the High Gothic Cathedral at Amiens. And if you're wondering about the curved stone armatures for the windows, here are their names. 
Uh, these images are taken from Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So many cathedrals, so little time. You now know the basic elements of a Gothic cathedral, and you've seen several splendid examples of the French Gothic. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through a series of slides just so you kind of get a final picture of the most famous of these Gothic churches and some of the terminology again. Chartres two towers, one pre and one post fire, make its west works especially distinctive. Although Amiens, as you've seen, also has two very different towers dating from different periods. Another famous feature of Chartres is the royal portal. You see that here with its statues of Old Testament kings and queens. We're going to get there next lecture. Here's the plan of Chartres, which you've already seen in one of the flying buttress slides. Note that the chevets or apse chapels or apsidal chapels are more distinct and less open than the later chapels at Amiens or even the chapels at Saint-Denis. At this point, you can identify an ambulatory, an apse, a choir, a transept, a nave, a narthex, and a portal, right? You've seen this elevation before, but note the especially clear image of a ribbed groin vault with a repeating pattern that unifies the church and draws the eye upward. Notre Dame's west works, by contrast with Chartres and Amiens, have symmetrical towers. Note, too, that the portal has a pointed arch in contrast to Chartres' rounded arch. Notre Dame of Paris was built about 50 years later. You'll see that Notre Dame's flying buttresses are even thinner and more decorated, and that the carving on the facade has become more ornate. I've stuck in a small photo of Chartres' West Works to help you make the comparison. Oops, I thought I did. Uh, you've already seen Notre Dame's quatrefoils and trefoils, but I'd be cheating you if I didn't include a few of its famous gargoyles, including some on the right that are actually disguised as rain gutters. Disney had nothing on Gothic sculptures. Here's another symmetrical high Gothic cathedral. Note that the nave is narrower, which made it easier to brace and enabled the builders to soar even higher. High Gothic cathedrals such as Rennes and Amiens decorated what seemed to be every square inch of their facade with colonnettes, pinnacles, rosettes, and of course the armature. That's the term for the framework, the stone framework of the great interior stained glass windows. Note that here the tympanum has been replaced by stained glass and that the sculpture now decorates each of the three sections of the West Works, not counting the towers, which, by the way, were added later. And here's another high Gothic cathedral from the same period. Like Chartres, this has asymmetrical towers. You've seen this before, but... I think this is so cool. Amiens is famous for its elaborately carved portals. When the doors were being laser cleaned in the 1990s, the restorers discovered that the western facade of the cathedral was originally painted in multiple colors. Remember, Greek statues were painted like that too. Art historians applied sophisticated laboratory techniques to determine the exact makeup of the colors as they were applied in the 13th century. Then, with the help of a lighting lab, they found a way to project these colors directly on the facade. Wow, I only found this image today. It is now seriously on the list. By the time Louis IX, or St. Louis, who died fighting in the Eighth Crusade, built this royal chapel, the windows were the walls, or at least three-quarters of the walls. The very thin supporting stone bars are known as mullions. The elements are extremely slender and linear, but it was the extraordinary windows that gave their name to the style, rayonant or radiant. And there you see the mullions. By the time this late Gothic church was built, the simpler, more classical Renaissance style was triumphing in other parts of Italy, and right after Christmas break, we'll be looking at that. In France, the flamboyant style was underway. It was characterized by extremely delicate stone carving and what I would call way over the top facade decoration. This is Rococo Gothic, a term that means nothing to you now, but you'll understand it when we get to Rococo art. Okay, I'm going to quit here before we talk about French Gothic statuary, stained glass windows, or Gothic architecture outside of France. I figure this is enough to absorb for now. In closing, here is one of the quick review slides that I borrowed from someone else, although the over-the-top comment is, I confess, my own addition. Now that we've looked at the bones of French Gothic cathedrals, we will move on to their splendid decoration. <laughs>